Let's see here. I want to pick. I want to back up a little bit. Pick up twenty six thirty one. Actually, thirty three, where Wheelop addresses the other soldiers and says, "You know, we made we made promises to our prince uh, thirty four in the beer hall. He gave us these rings that we would pay him back for this battle gear." Blah 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 blah. So he says, "We should go help Beowulf." He goes up. He encourages Beowulf. Beowulf takes a swing, sword breaks. Um, Wheeloff stabs the dragon a little lower down and fit 37, 20, line 2701, so that the fire began to subside afterwards. Then Beowulf, who still had his wits, draws the war dagger, bitter and battle sharp, and cuts the worm in two. Now, between Wheeloff going and Telling Beowulf, suck it up, Beowulf, you're Beowulf, and Beowulf cutting the dragon in two, just before Wheelof um, stabs the dragon, the dragon bites Beowulf on the neck. Okay? So the two of them felled their foe. Uh, their force took his life, 2706 or so, and they both together brought him down, the two noble kinsmen, Thane at need as a man should be. But Beowulf had his last work of victory. Why? Uh, because not from the gaping wound in his neck, but from the poison. Right. Well, it's not necessarily a gaping wound. I mean, we don't even know how big the head is, right? No, we're told that the dragon is the old English is actually fifty paces long. Where is that line? Yeah, I think it's like over by three thousand when they, you know. Go to like you know the tomb like the people. Like yeah, when they're getting ready to bury him. Yeah. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> so we all says some stuff. We'll come to it. But the old English, if I remember right, is. Uh, 3,042. <clears throat> he was 50 foot your Footsteps. Okay? Footsteps. So, does that mean footstep, the length of a foot, or pace? If it's the length of a foot, he's about 50 feet long. If it's pace, he's about 150 feet long. Pretty big difference. Okay? So the poison starts to make its way through Beowulf's body. And we're told 2715. He goes and he sits on a seat by the wall. Okay, so here's the barrow. Here are the stone arches at the entrance to the barrow. And apparently, what is outside? There you see. There's a bench. Why in the world is there a bench sitting outside this burial mound? It's kind of like the light and the decorations in Grindel's mother's underground hall. Does the dragon come out here and kind of curl up on it and look at the beautiful fiery red sunset at night? Maybe uh, it was originally designed there for like the guards to sit there because you know usually Roman guards. Except this isn't Roman. I mean, I mean arches think, are described. Yeah. They come from Roman. It's an anachronism in the poem, but there wouldn't have been Romans here. It's just a weird detail that the poet includes. Okay, so he goes and sits down, and he gazes on that work of giants, the unto your work. He sees how stone arches and sturdy pillars held up the inside of that ancient hearth hall. So it's not just out here. It's the interior has stone arches. Okay. Why is that the work of giants? Because Anglo-Saxons didn't build with stone. They built with timber. 
They didn't understand how this worked, especially when they saw places like the city of Bath and other Roman ruins like that. So what does he do? Wheelof goes up to Beowulf, 2720, and he bathes his water, he, excuse me, he bathes with water his beloved lord, his great prince, battered with gore, sated with battle, takes his helmet off, and Beowulf speaks. So, this is the first instance. Wheelof comes up, splashes Beowulf with water, kind of reviving him. I mean, he's alert, but he's, you know, bringing him back. And Beowulf speaks. He knows he's going to die. He knew clearly that his allotted life had run out. All gone was his portion days, death to miserably near. And he tells us, Now I should wish to give my war gear to my son if there had been such flesh of my flesh, if fate had granted me any heir. That's pretty clear, right? He has no children. That tells us Beowulf has no children. And yet some critics have suggested Beowulf does. Uh, I mean, they, could, they, they may have died, I guess, but... Beowulf makes it clear. He has, at least in the present tense, no heir. And then he gives us some interesting background information. I held this people 50 winters. There was no folk king, not any of the neighboring tribes, who dared to face me with hostile forces or threaten attack. So for 50 years, he ruled how? Peacefully. Okay? Nobody dared threaten him. This is why it's important that when we're told Beowulf chooses his fiercest warriors, they don't have any experience. I mean, they might have experience in war games, with each other, he says, the decrees of fate I awaited on earth held well what was mine. The decrees of fate. Think of that as weird. Not weird, but weird. What does he mean? The decrees of fate I awaited on earth. He let what happened happen. Okay. He doesn't, in fact, he's going to tell us in a moment, he didn't go out and do what Shield Sheving did or what Hrothgar did. He didn't go out and terrorize his neighbors. I sought no intrigues, nor swore, nor swore many false or wrongful oaths. That's litotes. Many None. Any. He didn't swear any false or wrongful oaths. For all that, I may have joy, though sick with mortal wounds. Why? Because the ruler of men may not reproach me with the murder of kinsmen when my life quits my body. I'm not a kinslayer. I never started any battles. I never got involved in intrigues, however you want to define intrigues. Now go quickly, look at the hoard under the hoary stone, dear Wheelof, now that the worm lies dead, sleeps with his wounds. Hurry! Why? So I can see what gold I won. Okay? Before I die. So the poet says, then swiftly I have heard, the son of Weston obeyed his lord, sick with wounds, wore his ringnet, and goes under the battles, under the barrow's wound roof. And he goes inside and he sees many bright jewels, glittering gold scattered on the ground, wonders on the walls, the lair of that worm, the old dawn flyer, flag and standing, ancient serving vessels, etc., etc. Old, rusty helmets, twisted armbands. Treasure may easily gold in the ground. Give the slip to any one of us. Let him who, let him hide it who will. That's a riddle, almost. Treasure may easily, gold in the ground, give the slip to any one of us. Let him hide it who will. That is, let him hide it who wants to try to hide it. What's the import of that little passage? 
it's not going to do you any good. It will slip through your fingers no matter how tightly you try to grasp to it. Okay? Likewise, he sees an ensign, all golden, hanging high over the horde, greatest handiwork, linked together with skill. Light gleams from it. So, ensign might look something like this. It might be four-cornered and have points, and on those points would be candles. Why in the world a dragon would have essentially a candelabra to give light in his cave when he could just, you know. But this is what we think it is with a post like this. One of the reasons we think that is because one of these very things was discovered at the Sutton Who site. See, the description of what was sent off in the burial of Shield Sheving at the beginning of the poem and the description of what Wheeloff finds in the barrel here matches very, very well what was discovered at Sutton Who. Okay? So, no sign of the serpent. Why? Because he's dead. So what does, Baal, what does Wheeloff do? Then the horde in that barrow, as I've heard, was looted by one man alone. That is, Wheeloff. He grabs an armful of treasure and walks out to show Beowulf. Brings this to some others have suggested that you've got the four points and rather than a candle on them that you have some kind of like pennant flying on it would be a little bit anachronistic but anyways he goes out and he finds Beowulf he was burning to know whether stout-hearted, 2785, he would find still alive the Prince of the Waiters. He finds him, his life at an end, and so what does he do? He sprinkles water on him again. Until the point of a word escaped from his breast. That is, I'm not dead yet. And he gives us a speech. For all these treasures I offer thanks with these words. To the eternal Lord. That's not Odin, because Odin isn't eternal. It's not Thor, because Thor isn't eternal. It's not a Germanic god, because none of the Germanic gods are eternal. Because Ragnarok ends them all. Okay? So this is the Christian poets, more than likely, Christian ideas bleeding into Beowulf. But he's not going to say, and I praise Jesus and his mother Mary, and they're going to open a way for me to heaven. He doesn't go there. What's he say? I offer thanks with these words to the eternal Lord, King of glory, for what I gaze upon here. Not period. Doesn't end the sentence. For that I was able to acquire such wealth for my people. See, it's important that Beowulf says these lines. For my people. And that he doesn't say, I did all this for me. Bury all this with me. Because we're going to find out something about this treasure hoard before we get to the end of the poem. What do we find out? It's cursed. There is a curse on this hoard. Now that I've sold my old lifespan for this hoard of treasures, notice, my life for the treasure. What's the treasure for? My people. So, if A equals Beowulf's life, excuse me, um, B's life, and B equals the treasure, and how does he put it? Go back. Such wealth for my people before my death day. I have sold my old lifespan for this treasures. And then B is also for the people, which are C, then A equals C. He's saying, I die for my people. Kind of like a sacrifice of sorts. 
Now that I've sold my old life, Ben, for this hoard of treasures, they, the treasure, will attend to the needs of my people. Notice your gloss says, usually translated, you, Weedoff, will attend. The Old English verb may be indicative or imperative, but it is unambiguously plural. The verb is plural, that is. Okay? The treasure will provide his people. Yeah. Okay? That it's, the treasures are what's going to provide. But the, the Old English, what line is that? 20, 2,800. Let me go back and see what it actually says. Now I am the heart of this treasure is bought with my life. Yeah, there's no you there. There's no, you know, your gloss down at the bottom. Usually translated, you, weed off. There's, there's literally no word for you in the Old English. It's just the verb in a plural form. So you have to, you have to supply the subject. They, those, okay? Sounds kind of similar to German because uh, well, it is German. Oh, yeah. Anglo-Saxon is German. I mean, it is entirely German. If you know German, learning Old English is pretty easy. Similarly, if you know Old English, learning German is pretty easy. But there's some changes that occur in Germanic after Old English um, that make learning learning German from Old English a little bit harder than the other way around. So. He says, these things are going to help the people. Why? Because I'm not going to be around. The brave in battle will build a tomb. Who are the brave in battle? The warriors after me. He says, they're going to build a tomb for me. They're going to build it high over my pyre on the cliffs by the sea. It will be a monument to my people and tower. No, to my people. Yeah, but it's for him. <laughs> high on whale's head. The old English is Hranesnas. So that seafarers afterwards shall call it Beowulf's Barrow, you know, when their board broad ships come around. So he takes the golden necklace off from around his neck. This is not the necklace Welfeal gave him, right? Because what happened to that one? He gave it to Helak, who did what? Lost it on his Frisian raid because he was killed. Okay. So he takes the golden circlet off his neck and gives it to Wilaf. This kind of is the emblem of kingship. Definitely was in Celtic society. Okay, the, the torque in Irish and in, in the ancient Irish society, that was symbolic of kingship. And there are Celtic parallels, analogs to Beowulf. And he says this. This should echo, if you've read any James Fenimore Cooper, you are the last survivor of our lineage, the Waymundings. In fact, James Fenimore Cooper wrote a novel titled, Not the Last of the Waymundings, Last of the Mohicans. The last of the Mohicans. Okay? I don't know that he knew this um, in the Old English. It had not been translated into modern English when Cooper did that. But there were editions of it in Old English. Not many, but there were some. Fate has swept away all of my kinsmen, earls, and their courage to their final destiny. I must follow them. <clears throat> and he dies. Okay? And from his blood... Right, that was the last word of the old warrior. His final thought before he chose the fire, the hot surging flames. What hot surging flames? Did Beowulf choose hell? From his breast flew. Who's speaking here? The poet, not Wheelof. From his breast flew his soul to seek the judgment of the righteous. The Old English is, from his body departed the soul set Jan to seek. So fastra dom. So fastra. That's righteous. Those fast in truth. Okay? 
judgment. The judgment of those fast in truth, or the judgment of the righteous. Okay? Notice, an ambiguous pronouncement. Is it really? It's not clear whether this means a Beowulf soul will receive the sort of judgment that a righteous soul ought to receive and so go to heaven, or that it will be judged by those fast in truth and therefore go to hell. It went to seek the judgment of the righteous. I think this harkens back to those lines 175 to 188, where the poet says, those who expect a change can seek after the death day the embrace of the Father. Okay, because it's seeking notice after its death, the judgment of the righteous. I don't think it would necessarily be seeking that if it thought it was going to go to the other place. So, 39. Wheelof sees him die. He also sees the dragon, coiled serpent and such. And we get along to skip here about how the dragon's never going to be flying, etc. again. And 2846, it was not long before the men late for battle left the woods. How late were they? That's life teeth again. The battle's over. The body's cold, you know. Those ten traitors all together who had dared not to hoist their spears when their lord of men needed them most. So the poet, the speaker, is really castigating them. And they come up and they go to Wheelof, and they're kind of like, hey, Wheelof, how's it going? It's kind of ironic from Christianity because, you know, there was only one traitor amongst the uh, disciples of Jesus. Yeah. But this is a different society, you know, it's a duty to defend one another and whatnot. Yeah. But they will tell them to stay, and they obeyed that order. Yeah, you could say that that was an order, but Wheelof didn't, and kind of the poet doesn't say anything negative about Wheelof. I mean, it's the poet who we can take the, as the voice of authority and the voice that wants us to follow that interpretation. God bear in mind, Anglo-Saxon times, you don't have any unreliable narrator like you do in modern literature. Your narrator in, in all of this literature, up until 1800, the narrator is reliable. I don't care what literary theory, whatever you might want to follow, says. Up until about 1800, you can trust what the narrator says. It's really Melville that introduces the idea of the unreliable narrator with um, Bartleby the Scrivener. And then after that, no holds barred, whatever the interpretation could be. So they come up to him. They see Wheelof, and Beowulf's head is essentially in Wheelof's lap. He's just kind of caressing his brow. He sat exhausted. Tried to rouse him with water. This is the third time. There is a baptismal image there. He's coming. Come on, Beowulf. Come on. You, you. No, he ain't coming back. Why? He could not, no matter how much he wanted, 2855, keep the life in the body of his captain, nor change any bit of the ruler's decree. The judgment of God would guide the deeds of every man as it still does today. So, this begins in Yardagum, in days of yore, but the poet keeps saying, God rules then as he still does today. Ruled then as he still does today. So what does Wheelof do? That youth was ready with a grim rebuke. And he says, 2864, the man who would speak truth must say that the Lord who gave you those gifts of treasures, the soldier's trappings, you stand in there, when often on the ale benches he handed out helmets and burnies to the hall sitters, a lord to his followers, whatever he could find, the finest anywhere far or near, that he did what? That all that battle dress he absolutely and entirely threw away when war beset him. 
Now, one way of interpreting what Wheeloff has just said, questions Beowulf's ability to judge the character of his men. In other words, Beowulf was not a very good judge of men. If he threw away that stuff, thinking that when the time came to it, when he really needed their help, they would support him. Because what did they do? <laughs> See you later, Beowulf. Have fun storming the castle. Or I was thinking that it could also be interpreted as he gave you that stuff, but it was just a waste because, you know, you didn't use it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. It is a waste. I mean, Wheelof says that. What I'm suggesting is Wheelof might also be questioning Beowulf's judgment, okay? That maybe he wasn't the greatest judge of character. I'm not saying that that is the correct interpretation. It's possible. He's definitely saying he might as well have thrown away that armor because you guys didn't use it for any good. All right. Our nation's king had no need to boast of his comrades in arms. Go back to the opening of the poem where the poet suggests that thus should a young man do. Line 20. Thus should a young man bring about good with pious gifts from his father's possessions, so that later in life, loyal comrades will stand beside him when war comes. The people will support him. Yeah, not so much in Beowulf's case. But the ruler of victories allowed that he, alone with his blade, might avenge himself when he needed your valor. Notice what Wheelof is saying about himself there. In that line. In that line, he says, the Lord of Victories, he enabled Beowulf to get the victory he needed. Only a little life protection could I offer him in battle. He's saying, the sword thrust I gave to the dragon, it was nothing. It distracted him. Notice the humility there. Humility is not a Germanic trait. That is, it's not a virtue to be praised. We've seen throughout Old English Wanderer, Seafarer, Dream of the Root to some extent. What do you want people to say after you're dead? He was amazing. He was amazing. He was a mighty lord. You don't want him to say, oh, he was such a humble person. No, because people don't remember that. So he goes on. Ever the worst was the deadly enemy when I struck with my sword, a fire less severe surging from his head. Less severe, that is, I put it out a little bit. Too few supporters thronged around our prince in his great peril. If some of you guys had helped me, maybe Beowulf wouldn't have been bitten in the neck. And they're probably thinking, yeah, but it might have been me, because look at Honshu. Go back to Grendel. What did Beowulf do? Let's see. How's he going to kill the first one? Because Beowulf's not, you know, here's Hrothgar's hall. Here's the doorway. Beowulf's not lying down in front of the doorway. I don't know about you, but if I were one of the 14 other men with Beowulf, I'd be going, no, 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 Beowulf. You, 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 you take the choice spot. You make Grendel step over you before he comes to get one of us. But he doesn't do that. Somebody else gets that honor. Now the getting of treasure, giving of swords, all the happy joys of your homeland shall end for your race. What's he saying to them will happen to them? And it actually happens right now with his words. Leave. Go. You lose everything. Your homes, your treasures, gone. That is, you carry what you have on you. You are now exiled. You're exiled. Death is better for any earl than a life of dishonor. Better to die than to not have honor. So, he orders the battle work announced to the camp up by the cliff's edge. Now this is interesting because we haven't heard about this. Apparently, 
here's the barrow, and they make their way, and there's, you know, the cliff's edge, and there's a bunch of people standing here. Okay, so notice the implication. Beowulf and a bunch of people march to here. Then Beowulf and how many go on? Beowulf plus 12. That's right. The one warrior is the uh, slave, so it's Beowulf and 11 others plus the slave, so that's 12. Parallel, going to his death, 12 people. This is like Christ going up to Jerusalem. Okay? Because when Christ goes up to Jerusalem, what do the disciples, what do the disciples think? Oh, yeah, die. we're going to die. And Thomas goes, yeah, well, we may as well die with them. And then what does he do? He goes out and he separates himself. The slave who led him there, he hightails it out of there. Why? Because he's not a warrior. So the, you're then left with the 11 plus Beowulf. Beowulf goes and fights the dragon. One comes and helps, and the others stay away. It's kind of like the crucifixion where Christ only has what? One follower present. Well, one disciple, not one follower. Because Mary's there, and he says to John, the beloved, behold your mother, behold your son. And from that moment on, John takes Mary into his household as kind of like his mother. So, we off orders the word to be taken back to this group. Who does he order to do that? The slave. No slave's gone. We think the slave's gone, but it's not exactly clear. Maybe somebody else is, you know, maybe there's a court chronicler of sort of sorts who kind of came halfway to, you know, record the events. Anyways, we're not sure. He sends a messenger, okay? Listen to the message the messenger gives. He who rode up to the Cape, 2898, was not at all silent with his new tidings, but he spoke truly in the hearing of all. Now is the joy giver of the Gatish people, the Lord of the waiters, laid on his deathbed, holding a place of slaughter by the serpent's deeds. Baal's dead, to put it shortly. Beside him lies the dragon. He's dead too. So, Beowulf's dead. Oh, man, bummer. Life sucks. But the dragon's dead too. Well, that's good. That's, you know, we don't have to worry about the dragon anymore. Wheelof sits, Weston's offspring. We keep getting emphasized. Wheelof is the son of Weston. Over Beowulf, one earl over the other, now dead. He holds with desperate watch, desperate heart, the watch over friend and foe. Now this folk, this people, that is, everybody here and everybody else who didn't come, but that is back in the kingdom per se, can what? They can expect, may expect, a time of trouble when this is told to the Franks and Frisians and the fall of our king becomes widespread news. All you know what is going to break loose when word reaches the surrounding kingdoms that would never enter into any war with Beowulf because he was Beowulf for 50 years, they're going to attack. The strife was begun hard with the Hugas after Helak came. Third reference to Helak's Frisian raid. After Helak came traveling with his ships to the shores of Frisia where the where attacked him in war, advanced with valor and a vaster force, so that the warrior and his burning had to bow down, fell amid the infantry. Ever after that, the Merovingians have never shown us mercy. Merovingians, actual known Germanic tribe, right? In the Sutton Who burial site were, I don't remember the number, I think it's 40 something, 33 or 43 Merovingian gold coins. Okay. Nor do I expect any peace or truce from the Swedish nation. So where are the, if you had a map, Denmark's sticking up like this, Sweden's come down here, Finland's way up here, 
Norway is over here. There's the island between Denmark and Sweden here. You've got the northern coast of Germany and such. Frisians are in this area. Heathenbards are over here. Swedes are up here. Danes are here and here. So he says what? The Frisians, Franks are down here. They're also the Hugas. Okay. They're going to come. The Swedes are going to come. Geatland is, the Geats are here. They're in the proverbial what? Rock and a hard place. Between a rock and a hard place. They're surrounded on all sides. Between the hammer and the anvil, they're going to get hammered. So why are the Swedes going to come? Because it has been well known that Anjantiao ended the life of Hathkin, son of Fremel, in Ravenswood, when in their arrogant pride, the Giedish people first sought out the battle shulvings. Who started the feud? The Geats. They started the feud against the Swedes. Who started the feud against the Frisians? The Geats. Immediately, the ancient father of Otara, that's Onyanthiao, old and terrifying, returned the attack. The old warrior cut down the sea captain, that is Hathkin, rescued his wife, bereft of her gold. Now, a lot of people understand that passage. Bereft of her gold, 2931. As being Golda Barovina. It's literally bereft of her gold. As being literally that Hathkin attacked on Yenthal and took his wife's physical, material riches, treasure. I don't. I think it means he raped her. And this is why on is really incensed. Okay. Onola's mother and Otra's hunted down his deadly enemies, etc., etc. With the standing army, he besieged those sword leavings, weary, wounded. He kept threatening woe. But for those sad hearted men, Solus came among the long with the sunrise. The sad hearted men, Hatkin's men. Why are they sad hearted? Their Lord is dead. But then, next morning, sunrise, and you get the proverbial the cavalry arrives in the form of Herak, right? The bloody, fit 41, the bloody swath of the Swedes and Geats, the slaughter of men was easily seen. The good man, that is Onyantiao, then departed, old desperate, sought his stronghold. He turned away. He gets killed. I'm going to skip a bunch at this point. And let's see here. I'm going to skip a whole bunch. Uh, Onyantau is killed 2999 that is the feud, feud in the fierce enmity this is why the Swedes are angry still but there's one more point to that okay. who's the last surviving member Of that Swedish family. You remember he had Elgis? Onion Thiao Othra Onala Anmund Edils. He apparently kills his brother. Then he attacks them. He is killed by whom? Weston is his servant right-hand man. He comes. He apparently kills Anmund. We're going to be told in just a moment. And what does he do with the treasure that he gets from it? He gives it to his son. Yeah. Actually, we were told that earlier. He takes the treasure. He gives it to Onola. Onola, being a good king... We're told he was called the best of sea kings. 
then bestows that treasure back upon Weston, from whom it is handed down to Wheelof. Wheelof is now king of the Geats. Eagles is now king of the Swedes. So he's got a whole bunch of reasons. Well, that's the weird part. Didn't like uh, what's it called? Um, what's his face's name? Beowulf help Eagles. Beowulf helped Eagles get vengeance on Olaf for killing his brother. Yeah, but but how did we lost? Where's Beowulf, Beowulf now? Yeah, <laughs> dead. See this, however. Between the Swedes and the Geats, this feud, this is still open. Why? What happens to the feud? How do you end a feud? I kill everyone. Annihilation. Yeah. That's how it ends. How did Beowulf end the feud between Hrothgar and the Grindelkin? He killed them all. Grindelkin aside. <laughs> he killed them all. So the only way you end a feud is... Total annihilation. Now that's how it stops. Generally, it doesn't happen all that often, right? Back then, it happened quite a bit. Did it? No. I mean, total annihilation? I mean, what did we see with the Wanderer? The Wanderer escapes. How, for whatever reason, whether the Wanderer was a coward and fled the battle or the Wanderer wasn't present at the battle. Okay? The Wanderer isn't there. So the Wanderer... If there's a feud between the Wanderer's people and the people who destroyed his king, then that feud idea is still at work. Here's the kicker. No, hold on just a moment because we're almost there. So that's the feud and the fierce enmity. Savage hatred of men. But I expect now when the Swedish people seek us out after they have learned that our Lord has perished, who had once protected his horde and kingdom against all hostility after the fall of heroes, the Valiant Shieldings, that's the manuscript reading, often amended to, excuse me, to read Shieldings. Why? Because the Swedes weren't Shieldings. They were Shieldings. Okay? Worked for the people's good in what is more performed noble deeds. And now we got to hurry. For what? We got to get Beowulf dead. And, excuse me, buried. So let's go look on, a, on our people's king. Go with him who gave us rings on the way to the pyre. No small port, part of the hoard shall burn with that brave man. That's Lycopes again. So if it's no small part of the hoard, how much is it? All of it. They're going to burn all the treasure in the barrel with Beowulf. What did Beowulf think he died for? The treasure that it would be a benefit, that it would be beneficent to his people. Hmm. But countless gold treasures grimly purchased and reigns here at last with his own life paid for. Then the flame shall devour the fire and fold. Let no war work, let no warrior wear treasures for your remembrance, nor no fair maiden have a ring ornament around her neck. Why? Sad in mind, stripped of gold, she must walk a foreign path. Foreign path? Exile. Exile. Not once, but often. Now that leader of our troop has laid aside laughter, his mirth and joy. If the women are going to walk in exile, what does that say about the men of the society? They're all about to die. They're going to be dead. <laughs> okay? And exile doesn't mean they're just going to be aimlessly wandering. I think it means, what is Hrothgar's queen's name? Welfeau, foreign servant. What's he suggesting is going to happen to the women? They're going to get captured. Okay? Thus many a cold morning shall the spear be grasped in frozen fingers, hefted by hands. Why will the fingers be frozen? Nor shall the sound of the harp rouse the warriors, but the dark raven, greedy for carrion, shall speak a great deal. Ask the eagle how he fared at his feast when he plundered corpses with the wolf. And we have there, the first time in the poem, the three 
what are called beasts of battle referred to. The raven, the eagle, and the wolf. Why are they beasts of battle? They feed on corpses. They eat the corpses. All right. So why will the fingers be cold in the morning? Because they won't be sleeping in a hall. These will be people who will be hiding outside, in the wild, in the wood. And the first thing they do in the morning is they grab their sword or spear, knowing they're being hunted down. Thus that brave speaker, the messenger, was speaking a most unlovely truth. This, this is not a, an easy thing to hear. He did not lie much in words or facts. It's more like to tease. He didn't lie at all. This is the poet now saying this about the messenger in days of yore telling us. So the poet is offering us an editorial comment. And he didn't lie. Why did he not lie? Well, as of the date of the manuscript that we have at least, roughly 1000 AD, where are the Geats? They're non-existent. Swedes, they're still around. Danes, they're still around. Frisians, they're still around. Hugus, Franks, Heathenbards, they're still around. The Geats, which were a historical people up until some time in the mid-first millennium, mid to third quarter, so 500 to 700 or so. They were a real, living, breathing people. But sometime after around 700 or so, we don't have documentary evidence, they're gone. No longer existent. So the troop of warriors arose. They go to the place where Beowulf is. They see Beowulf. They see the dragon lying on the plain directly across from him. 50 feet long. That's that 50 Footsteps, which I don't think means foot. I think it means steps. This is a big stinking it's a giant snake with wings and little legs. Okay. But how skinny would it be, though? No idea. Cups and vessels stood beside him. Why? Because. Wheelock brought this stuff out of the horde to show Beowulf. As if in the bosom of the earth they had lain for a thousand winters. Well, they had. All that inheritance, and there it is, 3051, was deeply enchanted. Line 3051, deeply enchanted. Galdra bewounded, okay. wound in a spell. The gold of the ancients was gripped in a spell so that no man in the world would be able to touch that ring hall unless God himself, the true king of victories, protector of men, granted to whomever he wished to open the hoard to whatever person seemed proper to him. So look at your little footnote. The power of the pagan spell can be overruled by the will of the true God. So whoever put it all in there puts the spell on it and says, damned, cursed, whatever, be the person who tries to plunder this. One of the big questions among Beowulf critics had been, it's not as much today, was Beowulf damned for getting the gold? Okay, which, if you want to get all legalistic and split hairs, did Beowulf actually get the gold? No. Beowulf didn't go in and pull the gold out. Who does? Wheelof does. And who kind of eats the fucking okay. eats? Or was it, were Beowulf and Wheelof damned? 
Did God allow them to do this? Is the question. Christian critics, which there aren't many today, but Christian critics, and by that I mean critics in the primarily 1940s, 50s, somewhat in the 60s, who read the poem allegorically. Many of them said, Beowulf is a damned pagan, and this is one of the reasons. He wins the gold for himself, even though I know the poet says, you know, Beowulf didn't win it for himself, he won it for his people. Okay? So, then it was plain that the journey did not profit the one who had wrongfully hidden under a wall that great treasure, that is, the dragon. The guardian had slain that one and a few others. Then that feud was swiftly avenged. It's a wonder to say. Um, I'm going to skip that part. So it was with Beowulf, 3069. Since until doomsday, mighty princes had deeply pronounced when they placed it there, that the man who plundered that place would be harried by hostile demons fast in hellish bounds. So it's not just you're going to be cursed. It's you try to take this gold, you're going straight to hell, and the demons will torment you. Unless, 3074, the owner's grace had earlier more readily favored the one eager for gold. Old English text is corrupt, the manuscript tells you, or the footnote tells you, Precise meaning of this passage is not certain. This is one interpretation among many others. Okay? Meaning seems to be gold is cursed unless God grants you the grace to recover it. So, some of those Christian allegorists of the poem, some of them, not many of them, said Beowulf is granted that grace. And that's why he could choose the judgment of the righteous. Okay? So Wheelow speaks. And listen to his speech. Often many earls must suffer misery through the will of one man, as we have now seen. Now, I think, and a few others do, Andy Orchard is one who does, I think that's a biblical illusion. As when Paul says, just as through one man, many have suffered, Adam, all the race of humanity, that's the many have suffered, and then Paul says, so through one man, all will be made alive, Christ, everyone else. Often many earls must suffer misery through the will of one man. Who's the one man? That damn slave who went stole a stupid little cup. So why will many earls suffer? Replay the messenger's speech. Beowulf died and his love son. Beowulf died and we're going to be the, in between the hammer and the anvil. And then he says, we could not persuade our dear prince, shepherd of a kingdom, with any counsel. Okay, before I even finish the rest of that idea, sentence. What does that imply? They tried, to talk about they tried to. They tried to persuade Beowulf with counsel. What? That he should not greet that gold guardian. Let him lie there where he long had been and inhabit the dwellings until the end of the world. We could not dissuade him from fighting the dragon, even though we tried to persuade him to let the dragon sleep. What is the uh, motto of Hogwarts? Do not, like, do, do not tickle a sleeping dragon. That is, let sleeping dragons lie. Because what happens when you wake the dragons up? They get angry. <laughs> Nothing good. Okay? And swamp of hellfire. Notice what we offer saying here. They offered him counsel. What's the dragon doing at this point when they offered Beowulf this counsel? Sleeping. Sleeping. The implication of that is what will the dragon be doing tomorrow? And the day after that? And for the next 300 years, like it seemingly has done for the last 300 years? I mean, you got to wonder, when's he going to eat? In other words, well, yeah, we don't get anything like that. What problem 
did the dragon serve for Beowulf the day Beowulf went to fight the dragon? It didn't serve any problem. The dragon was back asleep. We're not told that the dragon comes out night after night after night after night after night after night. We are told with Grindel, Grindel comes night after night after night after night for 12 years. The dragon comes out one night, torches everything, goes back to bed, and goes back to sleep. I think it also has to do with the fact that Beowulf is kind of obsessed with uh, killing monsters. So Okay, that's possible. You know. It's possible. So, when I, as I've said before with two other instances, raised this question back in the 90s, I was actively kind of working, gathering research and stuff on a book, raised this idea that, you know, this seems to me that Wheelof is essentially criticizing Beowulf. If he just let the dragon sleep, Beowulf would what? Still be alive. Still be alive. And we wouldn't be facing annihilation and our women wouldn't be facing walking in foreign paths huh and people said oh no that's not what he's doing no Baylor, he's not criticizing bail it's clear he's criticizing Baylor. i don't see how anybody could read that any other way no he held to his high destiny what's his high destiny yeah no i mean yeah he had to die at some point Monster killing. I, I began the class saying that one critic, Andy Orchard actually does this too, um, has suggested the whole manuscript that contains several other things as well as Beowulf is a Liber Monstrorum, a book of monsters. Are the only monsters in Beowulf Grendel, Grendel's mother, and the dragon? I don't think so. I think Beowulf is one of the monstrous characters as well. So, the horde is open, grimly gotten. That fate was too great, which impelled the king of our... It impelled. Fate is what? What will be, will be. It's almost like Beowulf did not have a choice in the matter. Why? Because when fate is involved, when weird is involved, you don't. It is what will happen. So he says, I was in there. I looked over all that treasure. When a way was open to me, not, by no means gently was a journey allowed in under that earth wall. So he says, I brought out a bunch of stuff, and Beowulf was still conscious then. 3094, thoughtful and alert. He spoke of many things. An old man in his sorrow, and ordered that I greet you. He asked that you build a great high barrow for your prince's deeds in the place of his pyre. Mighty and glorious. In the place of, doesn't mean instead of. It means we're going to have a good pagan burial for Beowulf, that is. We'll bring up a whole bunch of wood. We'll put Beowulf on top. Burn him to a crisp. Okay? And then on top of that spot, we're going to raise a big old burial mound. Let us now make haste for one more time to do what? Let's go inside the barrel and bring it everything out. Everything. Let the beer be ready, quickly prepared. When we come out, then let us bear our beloved Lord, that dear man, to where he must long rest in the keeping of the ruler. So, they bring from afar the wood for the pyre. Now the flames must devour the black blaze rise over the ruler of the warriors who often awaited the showers of iron when the storm of arrows hurled, blah, 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 blah. So the wise son of Weston summoned the host and seven things ride in a circle around Beowulf's body. Okay? And they chant some kind of funeral dirge. It was not chosen by lots who should loot that horde, 3126. Once the men saw it sitting in the hall, every part of it unprotected lying there wasting. Notice, it wasn't chosen by lot. What does that mean? There wasn't one person chosen. 
they all go in. Okay, keep in mind what's been said twice now about the Lord. So they all go in. There aren't any geats around anymore. There was little lament that they should have to hurry out with the precious treasures. They also pushed the dragon over the cliff, let the waves take him. The flood embraced the, embraced the guard of that finery, then the twisted gold, uncountable treasure was loaded in a wagon, and they carried it. Notice, Beowulf's funeral pyre isn't right outside the barrel. They... they Take it to the edge of the cliff, burn them, and then you're going to build that barrow on the edge of the cliff. So it's almost going to be like a lighthouse, but without the light. So, they bring all the people. They kindle there on the cliff, 3143. The greatest of funeral pyres, dark over the flames. The wood smoke rose, the roaring fire mingled with weeping. The wind lay still. It's an interesting little detail. The wind lay still. There's not even a breeze to blow the smoke of the burning wood and body and the stench of the burning flesh until it had broken that bone house hot at the heart. They mourned their despair, the death of their Lord, and the Gaidish woman lost there. Manuscript is damaged throughout this section. Readings in this passage are conjectural. It's not here clue. It's not clear who the Gaitish woman is, though her advanced age is indicated by her bound up hair. Germanic women, younger women, wore their hair down. Older women wore it all up like in a bun. We know this from other sources. Right? And this old woman apparently sings for Beowulf the king. Now, one German scholar wrote two books, two volumes of a study of Beowulf, and I'm not kidding. Those things are like, each one's about twice the thickness of this book. He wrote two volumes, all part of one book, two volumes that thick, so four times this thickness on five lines of Beowulf. In which he argues this is Beowulf's wife. Nothing in the manuscript suggests this is Beowulf's wife. Okay? So what does she do? She sings. What does she sing about? 3153, that she dreads the hard days ahead, the times of slaughter, the hosts of terror, harm and captivity. In heaven, Lotus, this beautiful personification, swallowed the smoke. So then they build the barrow, high, broad, visible from afar. They take the ashes, they put it inside, they place the rings and bright jewels, all the trappings that those reckless men had seized from the hoarder before. Reckless means thoughtless, careless, not giving consideration to. Those men seized all that, put it in this new place, that is, they take it from its original burial. They put it in this new place. And they let the earth hold the treasures of Earl's gold in the ground, 3167. Where it yet remains, 3168. Key idea here. As useless to men as it was before. Why is it useless? It's buried. Nobody's using it. It's buried. Nobody's using it. Why is it as useless now as it was before? They weren't using it then. Is the as it was before referring to when it was in the barrow? Might be. What else might it be referring to? When the geats were alive. All the people when the geats were alive? But it wasn't put there by the geats. It was put there by some unknown tribe or nation a thousand years previously. I think that's what the poet's talking about. It was as useless now being put in the barrel, as it was to that tribe a thousand years ago when they were still alive. So why was it useless to them then? Because it was cursed. Nope. Yeah, not working. Louder? Yeah, not working. They're all dead. 
Yeah. Why else? But what good does not. money do you in the final run? Nothing. Nothing. That's it. And yet, when the lay of the last survivor, when the last survivor put it in, what did he say? Hold now earth this treasure that he says. Men did what for? Died for. They died for it. What did Ben will say? He fought the dragon for and won for his people. Treasure. He gave his life for this. And it's now as useless as it was before. See, this is one of the themes of the book. It comes kind of like a minor chord, but like a minor chord in a work of music, it runs throughout. They died for nothing. The poet is telling us, not that Beowulf died for nothing, but that dying for wealth for riches, for gold, for treasure, is worthless. Tolkien, or let me go on to the end, and then I'll talk about Tolkien for a moment. So, they raise the mound. Twelve men sing around Beowulf's barrow here. They praise his lordship, his proud deeds, judge well his prowess, 3174, as it is proper that one should praise his lord with words. They showed him love, etc., etc. And then we get... The end, from 3180 to the end. They said, this is what the people say about Beowulf, that he was of all the kings of the world, mildest of men and the most gentle. We'll talk about that briefly. Kindest to his folk, most eager for fame. Let's start with the last part. Most eager for fame. The word used there, and it's one word, lof ye ernost. Lof is the word that's translated here, fame. It can also be praise, glory, reputation, if you want. A reputation can be negative or positive. Most eager is literally what this means. It's a word that we don't have in modern English anymore, so that's how it gets translated. Where do we see Beowulf eager for fame? When he arrived to the Danes to kill Grendel. Does he say, I'm here to build up my fame? I'm here to build up my reputation? I'm here so that everybody will fall down and praise me? Nope. Nope. Does he say that when he fights Grendel's mother? Nope. nope. Does he say that when he fights the dragon? No, but what does he say in all three instances? I'm a monster killer. That's kind of why I am. And if I'm victorious in each of the three instances, it's who's God. credit? It's because of God. Except with the dragon, he doesn't. He says, weird will decide. Okay? A lot of those Christian critics, because the poem ends with that word, Lofiernos, they say, yeah, see, Beowulf wants fame. He wants human glory. That's prideful. Therefore, because pride is the chief sin, straight to hell. Okay? What I find funny about that statement is that nowhere in the Bible does it say the seven deadly sins anywhere. In fact, that's a Roman and Greek mythology concept. No, it's not Greek mythology. It's a early... Um, it's an early classification of sins by the early church fathers. Okay, so Lofiernos, most eager for fame. What about the others? Kindness to his folk. How is he kind to his people? About fifty years of peace. That's pretty kind. He gave out treasure. He gave out treasure. Apparently to people who weren't <laughs> worthy of it. He didn't get involved in any intrigues. He didn't start any battles. He didn't slay any of his kin. He didn't get drunk at his hearth table and slay any of his own kin. Each one of those is in distinction to the other kings mentioned in the poem, whether good kings or bad kings. In other words, Beowulf is not your quintessential Germanic king. He's a different kind of king. By the very fact that he doesn't go out and launch battles against others shows 
he's other. Big capital O, other. Okay? Hrothgar did. And Hrothgar is called good king. Shield Shiving definitely did. He was a good king. Onla definitely did. He was called the greatest of all sea kings. Beowulf doesn't do that. Why not? Because he doesn't need to. He already has his reputation, right? Is it because he doesn't need to? Because, you know, all he does is go, holds up his hands and everybody else cowers. But if he did, I mean, think about it. He got his reputation. What could he do if we had this map up here? This little area is the Gita's kingdom. What could he do? Spend it all. <laughs> you know, it could go from here to here. That's what Shield Chevy does. He takes this little land here and he threatens all the people in the surrounding countryside. Hrothgar essentially does the same. It's people from the surrounding countryside that give him tribute so he can build Herod. Beowulf, eh, I'll just stay king this little plot. Don't bother anybody else as long as they don't bother me. Okay. That's part of the not getting involved in intrigues. So that's how he's kind to his people. Mildest of men and most gentle. I don't know if you're a day raven, you might not thought of um, him as being all that mild. He's the one that Beowulf kills by crushing to death. Okay, But he's mild to his people. He's mild to those around. He doesn't go to war against them, which he easily could. Notice what he told Hrothgar. Hrothric has any need? I'll come at the front of a thousand things. Apparently he doesn't need to. Because we're not told that he does. So what do those other three epithets do to the most eager for fame? If he was really eager for fame, wouldn't he have done more? Or is he eager for a different kind of fame? Because there's two kinds of fame. If one accepts the, the um, cosmology, let's say, of the poem. There's earthly fame and there's heavenly fame. Both the dream of the root and the seafarer talked about kind of the judgment or the praise of angels, right? Or, to use New Testament language, what St. Paul says in, I can't remember which letter, dying and having God say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, what are we told Beowulf sought? Judgment of the righteous. What little story, as he's making his way to the dragon's barrel, does Beowulf tell? He talks about Hrethel and his two eldest sons. The second eldest kills the eldest. Hrethel can't get vengeance. And so what does he do? He chose eternal counsel and died. Now, I had one student, one graduate student one year, who thought that and died meant that he killed himself. Nope. That's neither a Germanic nor Anglo-Saxon nor Christian virtue. Suicide wasn't an option okay, for any of those folks. Suicide was the coward's way out. That was like saying, my problems are too big, rather than my sword's bigger <laughs> than my problems. Okay? So it seems to me that what we have with Beowulf is we have kind of a, a different way, a different perspective. Not a so you've got the, let's say you've got the, on one side, I know we've got 10 minutes. On one side, you've got the pagan, let's say, way. On another side, you have, let's say, the Christian way, faith, trust in Jesus, all that kind of stuff. Beowulf's not here, but he's not here either. is in the middle point. That is, looking back to this and projecting forward to this. Kind of like, let's say, the end of, or if you want to, between the Old Testament notion, because how is God referred to there in the Old Testament? 
The same exact kind of language that we have God referred to in Baal. And yet in the New Testament, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Christ says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And he talks about the Spirit as well. We don't get that language here. But we get inklings of some of that. But the poet, the poet is thoroughly on this side. The poet is thoroughly Christian. But he's telling an old pagan tale. He's telling something from the past. Why? Well, this then takes us back to when was the poem composed? Is it 7th century or is it 10th century? Because if it's 10th century, everybody's already Christian. If it's 7th century, you might have some pagan holdouts. And he might be kind of trying to gently nudge them on. Now, I mentioned Tolkien. Tolkien said, and I mentioned Tolkien in relation to which line was that? And just as useless to men as it was before. Yeah, just as useless as it was to men before. Tolkien said in his essay on Beowulf, titled Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, delivered in 1936 to the British Society, um, that essay is the first work of literary criticism that looks at Beowulf as a literary work of art, rather than as something to be used to figure out customs of the old Germans, like gift giving or distribution of wealth or women's roles in the hall, that kind of stuff. Tolkien one was the first one to say, no, it's a poem. It's a work of fiction. It ought to be addressed and looked at as a work of fiction. And he titled it The Monsters and the Critics because prior to him, everybody who looked at the poem took the three monsters and pushed them aside, said they're not important. What's important is Beowulf in his relationships with Hrothgar, Beowulf in his relationships with Hela, the relations of nation to nation, Tolkien said, no, you morons. The monsters are at the center of the poem. That's why you have Bill of Grendel, Grendel's mother, dragon. They're all central, okay? But one of the things he said in that essay is that Anglo-Saxon literature, ultimately, all of it is about one thing. The death of man in all his works. Man there meaning humanity. The death of humanity and everything humanity produces. Cheery idea, right? All, all the literature is about ultimately what? Death. Why? Well, that takes us back to the dream of the rude, the wanderer, the seafarer, and some of what the poet has said here. Preparation. That it's all geared to this idea of you got to die, you better be ready. Okay? All right, we'll stop there. So, exam on Tuesday. What will the exam look like? Some of it will look like the quizzes we've had. Okay? Um, short answer question, fill in the blank kind of stuff. There might be some true, false, or multiple choice that will be kind of factual stuff anything I've talked about from the beginning of the semester to when I finally shut up can show up um, there will probably be passages to identify you'll identify them by author we have one that we know of right who okay. actually we have two that we know of Cadman and where is Cadman preserved? In B. Cadman and B. Those are the only two named ones. Okay? So if there are other passages not from Cadman and B, there will be. Those, the identification will be what's the title of the work? Or who's the speaker? It won't be something like often many earls must suffer misery. Because that's not enough. If the identification passages will be somewhat lengthy, minimum probably four lines or so, unless it's a passage that just ought to immediately ring a bell, okay? Um, which I can't think of any off the, off the top of my head. 
probably minimum four, maximum they won't be longer than, just because I like to save space on paper, uh, won't be longer than 20 lines. Am I? Well, speaker isn't the same as author. So if it's a speech, for example, um, Hrothgar's. Hrothgar's homily, one of Beowulf's speeches to Hrothgar, the speech of the rude to the dreamer, those kinds of speeches. You know, um, Cadman, sing me a song. Who's the speaker? God. Well, it no, might be. Not, that's not the cross. The, you know, the thing that he has the vision of. That wouldn't be, you know, where you give me a name, because there's not a name. You just identify the speaker, the person that told him to, okay? Um, things like that, right? You'll be, most of you, I, I would almost lay money on, most of you, probably half of you will be out of here in 30 minutes. That's usually what happens. Um, there might be one of you that sticks around the entire hour and 25 because you're going to be the person you're just racking you don't have it all filled out and you're going I'm not sure about this go with your gut always go with your gut all right and remember everything is on YouTube everything I've said at least is on YouTube and then Thursday we'll start back what it's supposed to be after <laughs> Thursday 